This program is made possible through the generous underwriting grants of the North County Times, serving all of North County with complete local daily news coverage and internet services. Hi, I'm Tom Morrow, host of Living Legacies, and today we have as our guest Vistas Jack Rowe, who is a longtime aviation enthusiast and expert. And when I say long time, I mean long time. Now, Jack, you've, uh, you're almost 90 years old. Yep. You've, uh, you've seen a lot, uh, a lot of changes in aviation over the years that you've been uh, following this field. Yes, I have, and as a matter of fact, I brought in a program uh, from uh, 1923, uh, isn't it? Oh, yeah, and, uh, and which Amelia Earhart was one of the participants, and that was at the old Grand Central Airport in Glendale. Uh huh. Yeah. What you you have a you you earned your pilot's license, and uh, and how old were you when you earned your pilot's license? You were, you were right out of high school, weren't you? Yes, I was just out of high school. Okay, now you were born in Los Angeles. And born in Los Angeles, raised in Burbank. And went to Burbank High. Burbank High School, rah mm -hmm. rah rah. <laughs> <laughs> well, before uh, we get into a lot of the things that that you have done uh, over your long career. Uh, uh, tell us about this particular model right here uh, and what this represents. That is a, a model of uh, Montgomery's uh, last airplane and John Montgomery was born down uh, just off of Highway 5 uh, almost at the Tijuana area. In the Otay Mesa area? Uh, yeah, Otay Mesa area. Uh, he was a professor of engineering and science. He built three different airplanes. This was his last one with the engine. The first two were gliders that he flew off of Otay Mesa. Mm -hmm. He first flew in 1883, which was 20 years before the Wright brothers. He would uh, go out and shoot seagulls and case their wings in wax to determine airfoils and so forth. That was one of his scientific approaches. And he had uh, patents on airfoils and controls, both of which the Wright brothers infringed upon, by the way. And here is a man that never got his credit, at, at, and I give talks at service clubs, that flew 20 years before the Wright brothers right out of Ote Mesa. Why is it that uh, Montgomery doesn't get uh, the credit that the Wright brothers have? Well, that's a very good question because as far as I know, back at that time of, of the what was going on in the United States, <coughs> San Diego was an, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Backwater. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, communication uh, systems were, were not that up to speed. And the Wright brothers were there where everything was, and uh, they got all the credit. And they, they flew uh, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, yeah. and uh, was right there in really the center of, uh, of uh, the population, so yeah. to speak. But uh, as I say, uh, Montgomery uh, uh, <coughs> flew 20 years before the Wright brothers. He was a, and he went about. He wasn't a bicycle mechanic, you know. He went about it very scientifically as a professor of engineering and science. Well, there were. There's been a couple of attempts to tell uh, both stories, as far as that's concerned. And interestingly enough, Glenn Ford played in a in a movie uh, about the Wright brothers, yeah, and then they, he, uh, they they made the no. Uh, well, if he played, I didn't see it. Uh, because I would have watched the Montgomery film. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember because they were yeah. bicycle mechanics. And but they, anyway, they to... uh, I got the contract uh, from uh, Columbia Studios to build 11 man-carrying airplanes off of Montgomery's three different airplanes. Yeah. We had to build... And this was for Columbia Pictures' movie, yeah, Gallant for, for Journey, Gallant about Journey. 1946? Yes, Okay. and uh, we had to build 11 of them in 60 days man-carrying. Mm -hmm. These all flew. Well, if uh, 
if uh, the youngsters out there or anybody that's interested in aviation would like to learn more about John J. Montgomery, I am sure that the libraries and the internet will have a lot of information on because this this early uh, aviation pioneer does not get the credit that he should. And uh, if you'd like to hear uh, Jack talk on this, I mean, you do lecture, you do lectures all over uh, the place. Uh, yeah, I do service clubs, and I take all three models uh, that uh, of the airplanes that he built. Well, let's talk about Jack Rowe. Now, you uh, this is uh, this first picture we have is at your father's garage. You're the you're the second from the uh, right. Now, oh, yeah, your my, father was an automobile mechanic. He was a uh, he was more than a mechanic. Uh, he built racing cars in Los Angeles, uh -huh. and that was in in our backyard, the garage that he had, where he built my first car off of parts from racing cars. <laughs> Now you uh, you said you worked for a uh, a pharmacist uh, drugstore while you were uh, going to high school. Yeah, for the whole three years I was going to high and school. And he's the, the the druggist is the one that taught you how to fly. Yep, uh, he was a he had been in the old Army Air Corps when he got out. He, he also was a druggist, and uh, he bought a, a Waco 10 with an OX5 engine. Mm -hmm. And uh, every Saturday and every Sunday for three years close the drugstore and away we'd go out to Burbank and go flying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was a wonderful man and uh, I had a painting made of his airplane and presented it to him uh, in later years. Well there's a lot of people from the LA and the Burbank area living in, in this area. What was his name? They might know him. Fred Vernon. Fred Vernon? Vernon. Okay. Mm -hmm. had, a, had a drugstore in Burbank. Huh? In Burbank. And uh, the last I heard uh, his relatives lived up in uh, all around Monrovia or someplace. Mm -hmm. Now this is a copy of that old uh, program that uh, you were telling me <laughs> yeah. about that Amelia Earhart was yes. involved in. And what was the date on that one? 19, March 17, 1923, and this took place at Glendale Airport. And I was there with my father. <laughs> How old were you then? Well, well, well been, been, been 10 30, years ago, Yeah, yeah. because you were born in 1913. Now this is a. You told me a wonderful story about this uh, this uh, this plane. These two planes, they were refueling in air, and this was what year was this uh, that this was taken? Do you uh, remember? That that was uh, also while I was uh, working uh, at the drugstore. So it was, uh, so when I was still going to high school. It was in the early twenties then. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the general Ivor Aker uh, was flying an airplane called a Question Mark to make a world's endurance record. The way they refueled the airplane was fly over uh, with a, uh, another airplane and lower a five-gallon can of gas down through a hatch to re keep refueling it. And we can see that uh, being done yeah. in this picture, yeah. And uh, I was making a delivery one day uh, because at that time the drugstore uh, delivered everything <laughs> and my old Model T. And uh, I was looking out the rearview mirror to watch the refueling. Up in the air. Up in, uh, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I checked the road, clear, no problems. And all of a sudden, the guy backed out from the curb in a Cadillac, and I piled right into him. So it cost me $35 <laughs> to fix up my $25 car. When I went to work at Hughes Aircraft, General Aker had retired and gone as general manager at Hughes Aircraft. I uh -huh. walked into his office one day and I said, General, you owe me $35. He said, what do you mean I owe you $35? And I told him this story, which he got a big bang out of. <laughs> he used to give talks and he would tell about that story. Okay, now you started your aviation career as a pilot uh, learning while you worked for the drugstore. When you got out of high school, then what happened? What did you do then? When I got out of high school, I went to work, uh, well, I had two jobs. I worked at Lockheed during the day, and then I would go to a Warner Studio, which is in Burbank, uh -huh. and work at night in the scenic department. Uh -huh. So uh, I was a double dipper. So, so you were you were uh, worked at that uh, at Lockheed at Burbank during the daytime and in the movie business at night. Yeah, I was in the scenic department painting scenery. Scenery, okay, all right. Uh, now, what did you do at Lockheed? I was in the experimental engineering department, and uh, we built the XP thirty eight, which is the first P thirty eight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to uh, Marshfield with it for its first flight, and that was in 1938. And incidentally, the P-38, the top ace in World War II, Richard Bong, uh, was the top ace flying a P-38. Well, I understand it was a very good aircraft. 
Well, I've flown in it uh, three or four times and uh, done everything in the world in it. And, and if you ever want to get into an interesting thing, do a hammerhead stall where you go up and then you chop the engines and it whips down. There are not that many still flying there, are there? <laughs> and, I flew, well, and I fired the guns one time and had a... Uh, well, Jack, we're going to have to move along. Okay. We're going to get a lot of story told because we're out half done and we don't even we haven't even got you to World War II yet. Uh, <laughs> in 1939, you went over with a special detail from uh, uh, from Lockheed to, uh, to to reassemble what 250, uh, 250 bombers, 250 Hudson bombers in, and, in to Britain. Yeah, and that was the largest order ever given for airplanes in the world, and uh, I was the armament uh, expert, so called. Uh, went over there in January of uh, 1939. Of course, World War II began in September of 39, so that, yeah. you were you were right there at well, the very I, beginning. I, I have the actual newspaper too of uh, England uh, with the big banner headline: "Britain at War, September 2nd, 1939." Mm -hmm. Now, did you stay there for while they assembled all 250 planes? Or no, no, because they brought me back. Uh, and put me into the onto the P-38. Uh, uh, when did they roll the P-38 out as an operational aircraft? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, that was uh, that was in the early 50, 42, early, no, 43. No, yeah, around about that. Even maybe before. Mm -hmm. What else? Now, what did you? What after the uh, after the uh, the 38 was uh, uh, made operational? What what they have you doing? Then they sent me to uh, uh, Iceland during the Berlin airlift. Well, now that's that well, was, that's a big that's ten years. Oh, okay. Okay. What, years what did you do during the war? Oh, I, I uh, was finally uh, they put me into the contract department. <laughs> oh, okay. As a technical expert in the uh, contract department. Well, that sounded boring as hell. Did you no, did you have no, some fun it with was that? Very interesting. Uh, it was a completely different. Uh, type of a thing for me to do uh -huh. and getting into paperwork and uh, I ended up as the uh, head of contracts and uh, well now you is this about the time that you had uh, you had your office across from another uh, from an office of a, of one of the uh, of B17 the, inspectors of the army uh, army air corps army air corps B17 yeah, instructor and, and there was or, a, uh, inspector uh, yeah it was a, a real pretty girl that was uh, working in the army air corps as an army air corps inspector uh huh and uh, and uh, short story, we finally uh, met. No, the Jack, you have no short stories. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm we, sorry. We, we finally met and married, and uh, this is my beautiful bride sitting back here with Ray. Well, well Betty's in the studio now, and, and and of course that is not a short story. You've been married 56 years. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, and she, uh, what what was her her role as an inspector on the B-17? What what did she inspect? The uh, was it, it was just a quality control that, type that, of... That was a final inspection, going over the whole airplane and making sure everything was as it should be. And they made over, the, 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 the U.S. made over 20,000 of those planes. Yeah, so they, it was a great airplane. Yeah, it was a great, uh, it was a great part of history. Uh, let's go on now. The, tell me about this uh, experience you had in Iceland at the uh, at uh, Keklivak uh, in 1948. This is during the Berlin airlift. Yeah, well, in the... Uh, there was a U.S. Air Force fighter base in Keplavik, Iceland. Uh, when the uh, Russians uh, started heating up the Cold War, it looks like it's going to be a hot war, the Icelandic government told uh, the uh, Air Force or the military that they had to get out of Iceland because uh -huh. they were afraid of, uh, if it was there, the Russians were going to bomb Iceland off the face of the map. So the State Department made a deal with them that if a private contractor came in and ran the air base, would they go for that, which they did. Lockheed got the contract, so Lockheed sent me up to Iceland, and I was assistant manager of a U.S. Air Force base. Mm -hmm. We had a PX, a commissary, motion picture theater. 
You had all uh, of the had, all the conveniences of a small town. I had a Chevy staff car. We had a four-engine DC four to fly back and forth to New York. And this was right after you and Betty had uh, just gotten oh, married. Yeah. Yep. And, and you took her with you. Oh yes, indeed. I bet she thought she'd gone to heaven with a place well, like that. Uh, well, not particularly because <laughs> <laughs> the only housing up there was the uh, old World War II Quonset huts. Uh huh. Yeah, and, I've lived uh, in those. And yeah. we had to uh, scrounge, as the old word. Uh, all of the things in order to get this uh, Quonset hut uh, working. Livable. <laughs> and um, that's quite a story in itself. Well now, let's move along. Uh, over the years, I, I just want to kind of uh, uh, bring this all together. You worked 28 years for Lockheed, but then you went to work for Hughes Aircraft. Uh, well, I worked for Northrop Aircraft too. Uh, well, well for, I know, but I mean, oh, oh, I went. To you work. went. To, you went to work for for Hughes for 35 years. Yes. And then you were, worked for Northrop for five. Yeah. Now, right there, we've got 68 years. And, uh, well, that's about what I've been doing since <laughs> I was a kid. <laughs> and then you uh, then you went to work for uh, Radio. Radio Plane, which has uh, built target drones up in Van Nuys. Yeah. Yeah. So if if it flew or it flies, you've uh, you've seen it, rode in it, flew it, or uh, yeah, yep. help build it, help build it, <laughs> including the Montgomery airplanes. Now what uh, uh, you, you you told me that you had uh, you sold a lot of your collection of uh, models to the uh, Santa Maria Air Museum. Now what? Tell me about your your models. Okay, they they were in a sense not my models per se. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, who I got to know very well, uh, lived in Akron, Ohio, mm -hmm. and uh, he used to build these models, uh, and they were beautiful, uh, and dioramas with little cars and figures and the whole thing. And uh, when he was getting uh, along in years, uh, he didn't know what to do with them, so he asked me if I would find a home for him. So uh, I, uh, he sent them out to me. They were all in, in individual crates. And incidentally, we had them on display down at Browns Field when they had the World Congress of Flight there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so later, he, uh, he said, well, gee, uh, you know, can you sell them for me? And I said, well, I'll try. So I finally contacted the Air Museum, Santa Maria, and uh, we sold them for $25,000. And of course, I sent him the money and he sent me back a good a thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, why uh, now? I know there are a lot of model airplane enthusiasts. Why are models important? Well, I think that that's the fundamental uh, uh, thing of uh, getting into aviation. Uh, you know, for for a young boy or or girl to build models. You know, and you get interested in flying, and, uh -huh. and uh, that that was, I think, just uh, basic. Well, I mean, you take this model that we have in front of us here. That. Yeah. That's probably one of the few examples that you could actually put your hands on to what Montgomery's plane looked like. Well, there, it, it, this these, this model here, and as I say, I have the first two models of, mm -hmm. of Montgomery or airplanes that Montgomery made. And uh, a friend of mine, who I've known by the way for something like 65 years, mm -hmm. uh, is a model builder. He's the one that built. I didn't build this. Uh, this airplane, mm -hmm. but uh, I, he worked for me at, at uh, Radio Plane, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, he built all these models, and, and we go out to service clubs trying to give the story of Montgomery. I, I should have asked you this earlier when we were talking about Montgomery, but has Smithsonian done anything for Montgomery? Have, uh, do they have any of no, his models? No, as a matter of fact, even the uh, Air Museum down in San Diego, I went down there one time, and they've got one one piece of one of these airplanes and that's it. Uh, we made some models and, and took them down to Montgomery Field uh, and uh, presented them to the manager of the airport there at Montgomery Field. And uh, he had them in a, a case and when he retired he took the models with him so there's nothing down there at Montgomery Field. It's, it's, it's almost a crying shame that the San Diego Air Aerospace Museum wouldn't we, you wouldn't uh, recognize and honor they, uh, Montgomery. They, they have one little uh, little piece of one of these airplanes, and that's it. What are you going to do with this model? Well, I would never give it to them because I don't know. You what don't know what they're going to do with it. Yeah. yeah. 
It's interesting that the Smithsonian, as much as they're yeah. they're they're into aviation, uh, that they wouldn't uh, wouldn't well, well, recognize I, I Montgomery. That, I think that it's a matter of, of uh, over the years. You know, the Wright brothers have got all the credit. Yeah. Well, so and so Wilbur got the was it Wilbur or Orville got the number one uh, pilot's license. Yeah. And so no one wants to, uh, you know, upset that uh, hi hi bit of history. That what happened to Montgomery? How old was he when he died? Well, he was flying this airplane. He he suffered from vertigo. And oh, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and he was flying this airplane uh, one day, and he had a uh, fit or whatever you call it of, of vertigo, mm -hmm. and he went in and crashed and killed. All of the history which I have a books on, uh -huh. was by his brother and sister, who at the time they made the film were still living, and uh, they provided the studio with a lot of the history of, of uh, John J. Montgomery. You mentioned that he was a professor. Of a professor of engineering and science. And, and where was that? At uh, uh, Santa Clara University. Uh -huh. Up north? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But now, where did he did he crash here locally, or did he crash up north? He crashed up there. I see. But, it, but the other the other two airplanes, he flew off of O.T. Mason. Uh huh. He was uh, born and raised it. Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah he's, he's local. Yeah, his homestead's still there, and they yeah. have a plaque and the whole bit there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you. Okay, very quickly, because we're running out of time. <laughs> very quickly, Jack, tell me the story about you piloting the B-57. Oh, the B-57. That was that's a, that's a, this plane yeah, right yeah, here. Yeah, uh, your twin-engine uh, jet uh, mm. uh, light bomber. It was, that was uh, built by Lockheed? Were, no, no, that's British. It's a British plane, okay. It's a British airplane, which the uh, <laughs> U.S. Air Force bought some. Can you get us to Canada and back in three minutes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I worked with the, uh, I used to be, uh, develop a trophy to give to the top squadron in the U.S. Air Force mm -hmm. uh, every year, the, the top one. Uh, this one particular time they were going to do a joint uh, meet up in Cold Lake, Canada, mm -hmm. which was out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So <laughs> I developed the trophy and by the time it was finished I was going to have to hand carry it up there. So I flew up, got into uh, Vancouver. Uh, British Columbia. Uh, the uh, airplane I was to take over to Edmonton uh, had all, had a bomb scare, so they held it up for two or three hours, and by this time it's up to 11 o'clock at night or something like that. So you it, finally got into Coles Lake, what, the next morning? got into Coal Lake. No, it was only a, an hour and a half or two hours from Vancouver to Coal Lake. And so I get in there and I'm sitting there wondering what I'm going to do and the two Royal Canadian Air Force guys came up and said, you Mr. Rowe? I said, yeah, fine, we have an airplane for you. So they flew me uh, up to Coal Lake. So after I got up there, I was telling my friends about this problem getting up there. And so this uh, uh, colonel said, gee, we'll send a uh, T-33 jet uh, from Yuma, Arizona, up to Coal Lake, Canada to take you home. So they sent the thing up. and. But he was flying this B-57. We've got one minute, Jack. Okay. Just, well, tell, anyway, just tell about the B-57. B-57. Anyway, he uh, had a big party that last night. He got drunk as a skunk. We were to meet to take off in the B-57. I was down there waiting for him and doesn't show up. I go up and knock on his BOQ room. It's, it's uh, you know, the thing that came to the door you wouldn't believe. <laughs> So we go out, I get him and out, we get in the airplane, he takes off, he says, Jack, I can't fly this thing. So I had to fly that B-57 from Cold Lake, Canada, down to uh, uh, Hill Air Force Base and uh, out of Salt Lake. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jack, you got a million of these stories, and I'm, I'm telling you folks, we could sit here for two hours and talk with Jack about aviation and about his experiences, but we don't have that much time. We're out of time. Thank you very much, Jack, for joining us. And uh, if anybody would like to have a wonderful speaker for their group, get Jack Rowe. Jack <laughs> Rowe of Vista. I'm Tom Morrow. Thank you for joining us here on Living Legacies. This program is made possible through the generous underwriting grants of the North County Times, serving all of North County with complete local daily news coverage and internet services.